Right. So I'm um, from Anzog, but I'm really a recovering public servant, and I had almost three decades, um, s several stints in the Department of Premier and Cabinet in Victoria, but mainly in what is now the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's a reasonable question to say, why am I here, apart from the fact that Anzog's given money and so, you know, somebody from Anzog gets to speak. But I have had a lot of experience um, in public policy, mainly in social policy. Last year, some of my former colleagues now in Premier and Cabinet asked me to come along and speak to their planning day on success in social policy. And I said, I don't know why you've said an hour aside. This is going to be quite a short presentation. So um, I'm, I'm probably, you know, the low point of the day and it'll all get better from, get better from here in terms of um, the sort of brutal realities um, of the policy research interface. Um, OK, so you'll all know this is from... Um, Bridgman and Davis, the Australian policy cycle. This latest edition is Althaus, Bridgman and Davis, and so I have to be very careful what I say because Althaus is my boss. Um, <laughs> so I'm relying on you all to not say to anyone that I did say, I just so wish that bore some relationship to reality. I think, I think we say it's, it's a way of organising your thoughts about what isn't going to happen when you do public policy. <laughs> Um, in government, and then when I discovered the garbage can, I realised that you know my life had in fact been depicted in a diagram, <laughs> but possibly not in a good way. So, okay, when you're trying to influence public policy, this is what you have to know: um, that you are dealing with decision makers who have a completely unrealistic, crazy mad view of what they want policy to create. Um, and in the most important line there is there are no unsung, unsung heroes in politics. So you have to understand they work in a political environment. They have, and this is always a surprise to people because there always seems to be an incredible amount of money in government. In fact, the room for action in government is almost zero, especially in the state level. Um, you are running huge service systems and they take 99.9% .9 of the annual budget every year just to keep those going. And of what you think might be the discretionary amount, most of that is spent fixing up messes that they hadn't intended and hadn't planned and cost overruns and wage settlements and all kinds of ugly things. So the amount that ministers actually have to do the things which get their hearts beating faster, the things they did in fact come into government to do, is minute and there are far more ideas with good evidence behind them than there, are, than there are dollars to do that. So that makes the policy process not just um, competing for large pools of money but trying to tell a story that resonates on tiny, tiny bits of money. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to be, you know, downhearted about the current world but Apart from the usual things about 24-7 and permanent campaign and the fact that governments seem not to be lasting more than one term these days and the general post-Trump thing um, and the loss, to, loss of trust in institutions, paradoxically, some of the new ideas about opening up the policy process and in particular genuine co-design may in fact not sit well with rigorous evidence because when communities get the pen, when the people get the pen, when you crowdsource your ideas, they may not be consistent with the evidence. Um, and I'm not reading much, I must say, about how you square that particular circle in terms of um, trying, to, trying to make all those ideas work, work well. OK, so um, this, is, this is my... Um, I've got five sets of rules for the different people in the room. Um, and the first one, you know, you may wonder why it took me 27 years to arrive um, at the insight that there's a lot of human nature in the room. Um, when you're dealing with decision makers, there are always really good ones, people in both government and politics, who are there with an eye to the long game, who want to make the world a better place, who think also about their legacy and not about tomorrow. Um, and with those people, you can appeal to all the things that all of us are most comfortable with, social justice values and, and evidence. 
But not everybody is like that. So actually there's no point in using those kind of appeals when the people you've got are interested in doing over their factional enemies um, and various other sort of human qualities of envy and greed and selfishness and narcissism and all those kinds of things. Um, and so my advice always to my colleagues, etc., was if we've got to go with who we've got in the room, we have to look for what are the incentives that are acting on those decision makers and we have to frame the good things we want to do in the world in terms that resonate with their motivations, even if those are not... Um, ones that we might share. Um, the second point is that certainly in Australia, jurisdictions are in, have incredibly competitive instincts, and so I'm prepared to confess it. I have shamelessly said to ministers, now look, I know we're not competitive, but New South Wales is doing, or Queensland, and sometimes I've said, even Western Australia has to. <laughs> Um, or New Zealand, which is very, you know, very big in the competitive in competitive stakes. And for this, I have to say, APO, when I was a policy analyst, was just so absolutely wonderful because I was there, you know, working out what everybody else was doing through through their collections. It was just fantastic. Um, but you know, use policy transfer is is an absolutely instantaneous thing these days. Um, and it is, um, you actually, given how many bad ideas are transferred from other places, you really want to use um, the, the way in which ideas leap from jurisdiction to jurisdiction for good. Number three, academics. Have we got academics in the room? Yeah. All right, okay. I, I'm afraid I have had some sad and sorry experiences where academics make appointments to see ministers and it takes months to get to see them and they finally get into the room and the minister says this naff thing like, so, you know, addressing obesity, what are the three, you know, if you had to give me three ideas, that I, what would they be? And those academics say, more data minister and then more research by us. <laughs> uh, and this is where I'm in a fetal rock under the table thinking, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Um, you actually need a bit of moral courage, even if the data is, you know, don't qualify your data to death when you're in those conversations. Um, this is a moment to have some moral courage, come out from the shadows, don't play that game where you're never heard from except when someone else publishes a paper and then you're all out there piling on saying what's wrong with it. If, you know, if a minister asks you a question that might be useful, give an answer. Number four, um, and that's for people from the not-for-profit sector, people from the not-for-profit sector. I don't know, maybe, maybe this fashion has passed since I was in government, um, but every time... Um, not for pro groups of not-for-profits came to see ministers. They called for a long-term, non-partisan, joined-up strategy on everything. Um, and I can see why, and that's what the evidence would tell you as well. But first of all, governments have terms and ministers have terms and, you know, what did posterity ever do for them? They have to show some result immediately and they only have control over one portfolio. Even in Victoria with these monstrous portfolios, um, there is a span of control and ministers can only do certain kinds of things. And you may have noticed we live in an incredibly partisan world. The space for non-partisan action is tiny and it's probably appropriately occupied by Indigenous affairs and everything else, we may as well deal with the fact that it's going to be partisan and there's just no point in, in um, promoting idealistic solutions which just don't take account of those realities. Um, and my last point for my fellow bureaucrats. Do I have any fellow bureaucrats in the room? No? Oh, OK, good. Um, this actually was a wonderful line from Andrew Tung, who used to be the head of the Premier's Department in Victoria. We must never think we're better than the democracy we serve. It is very easy when you're an extremely well-educated bureaucrat and you're dealing with ministers um, to, <laughs> to, to not only feel contempt but allow that to show. Now, I can see that when Rex Tillerson called Trump, and he's not denying it, well, you know, moron, maybe even with an adjective in front of the moron, I can see that he spoke for many of us about many of our decision makers. Um, but we, if you want your words to resonate, if you want good policy to happen, you must not make your decision maker feel stupid. 
Um, and that includes using fancy jargon language, acronyms that they don't understand, assuming they've read heaps of things, which they haven't. Um, and the other point is that and there are very, very few people who watch a sort of ministerial year, day, year and term up close. And so it's very difficult unless you're, an, you know, you keep watching the Hollow Men and Utopia and um, to understand that politicians have language that's partisan language. They have seasons, they have cycles. There's budget and non-budget. There's first year of a term and last year of a term. There's, I've been around for a long time, I'm new. Um, there are all those rhythms which actually affect the, the effectiveness of the, of the kind of advocacy that you might want to do for good policy. And to make an impact, you actually have to understand those things and connect with them. OK, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Monica. Um, uh, would you like to go next, um, Joe? Um, just while you're getting organised. Um, in defence of academics, I was once summoned by our Minister of Housing and, and I had the three points. <laughs> These are the three things you could do, Minister, to improve housing outcomes in New South Wales. I, you know, like I rehearsed all the way in. There were, you know, no more further research. We didn't want more money. We knew the answer. I got in there. His first question was... Has anyone from the Premier's um, office been talking to us about housing issues? Because he thought he was getting white-handed by the Premier's office. And then he was asking an academic for political advice about this. And, like, seriously, I didn't get a chance to use my, um, my, my three points. He didn't actually um, stay the Minister for very long. It was New South Wales. Ministers come and go very quickly. But... Um, I, I do take your point. Um, a lot of academics who could make a contribution almost know zero about the policy process and want to give ministers one-hour lectures um, in a five-minute slot, and it never ends well. But um, you know, thanks very much. I'm going to give those um, th those five rules to, um, and certainly the academics one to m to, to my colleagues. Um, so I appreciate your help. So uh, uh, over to you, Joe. Thank you, and Monica. Thanks for kicking us off. When we got the details of the program, I was listed as first, and so I decided I was going to be provocative, but now Monica's done it for me, <laughs> so you're going to get it twice. And guess what? I've got five points as well. <laughs> Slightly different, although some resonance. Um, for six of the last seven years, I've emceed an um, annual event called The Power to Persuade. Has anyone been to that? A few people. Um, and The Power to Persuade is, in a sense, what this panel is. Seven, for seven years, people from the community sector non-profits, um, social enterprises, academia, public policy, and to a degree the private sector have come together to talk about how do we influence public policy, particularly in the social policy domain. And we always start with earnest discussions about the value of the evidence, and usually within anything between five minutes and two hours we acknowledge that policy making is not rational. Um, then we talk about policy as theatre, and then we usually by, we get a bit depressed by about lunchtime and then somewhere towards the end of the day we refine ourselves and the hybrid nature of policy making and policy influence and the fact that there is some point of intersection between evidence and, uh, and the doing of policy making that gives those of us who are involved in generating evidence some hope. Uh, the reason I'm articulating that is, I mean, in a sense, you know, Monica did that better in the first 30 seconds, and thanks for putting up the policy cycle. I did, I was <laughs> contemplating having one slide, which was the policy cycle with a cross through it. Um, uh, but really, I guess, just to flag that I think that, that even though we've done that for seven years, everyone always comes back, and we've, there's ne we've never had a non-sold-out power to persuade forum, and that tells you what the appetite is collectively for trying to solve what may be an um, irresolvable problem. I was writing my notes for this conversation and I suddenly realised, and it might have been because I was rereading The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole, age 13, three quarters, that actually I wasn't creating points, I was creating a manifesto. <laughs> so here's my manifesto for you for the um, discussion today. First point, evidence is intrinsically linked to its context and purposes. I cannot cope with going into another room, and I don't wish to in any way denigrate any person or disciplines, but going into a room where a senior economist from government talks about the gold standard of a randomised control trial 
and all the other economists in the room nod sagely. And then another cycle happens. It's almost like um, the discussion about what's the, um, what have the Romans ever done for us in um, uh, the um, uh, life of... Is it the life of Brian? Or yes. Yeah, in the life of Brian. You know, we have that conversation. So, yes, we all agree it's the gold standard. Oh, except when it's not the right... You know, it's not actually solving the problem that we want to solve. Oh, yeah, and actually there's some ethical problems with it when you're working with disadvantaged and highly vulnerable people. Oh, yeah, and it's pretty expensive. And actually, it only works really well in purely experimental contexts. And so, we, you know, by the end of that conversation, which I've heard at least 50 times in my life, we go, actually, you know what? The randomised control trial, and I'm not trying to pick on it, is not a gold standard in a universal sense. It has absolutely credible value in a particular context where it's answering a particular question, and that's the key to good evidence. So good evidence actually answers the question you're trying to ask. Um, that, to me, is something that we really need to get clear on. Um, and also to recognise that many of the methods that we've historically used for uh, designing uh, entries into finding evidence are based on, at best, complicated systems, not complex systems, and certainly not trying to uh, generate evidence around what innovation and effective innovation looks like. So, we, you know, the, the nature of that kind of evidence building requires different approaches. Rather than the traditional focus on cause and effect, it requires a focus on emergence, patterns, understanding um, and reflect, you know, uh, reflecting uh, back on what's worked, what hasn't and why, and then taking that forward to the next stage. My second point, evidence is not good evidence if people's experience is not at the centre of it. And again, I'm going to, well, I'm going to put my, my diversity hat on. I'm, I'm a non-Anglo-Celtic woman with a disability, so there you go, I'm ticking a few boxes there. If I go into another room with a group of white people, listen to them talk about the um, uh, decisions that need to be made on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and I include myself in that group of people, or um, a group of people with a disability, I think I might tear my hair out. You know, in the 1960s, second wave feminists and civil, civil um, rights activists pointed out to us that evidence is not evidence if people are not at the centre of it. Now, I don't mean in any way to disregard Monica's very um, salient point about uh, not, you know, this is not, this is not me making a, um, a bleeding heart statement about the need to hear people all the time. There are, um, there's a diversity of sources of evidence and there are models of uh, introducing that evidence to diverse groups of people so that they can make better sense of it. So I look at my colleague Jane Farmer and I look at my colleague from the Australian Centre for Social Innovation here, both an organisation and an individual who are involved uh, in the use and creation of methodologies that are absolutely about bringing expert evidence together with community experience and making better sense of the two of them together. My third point, evidence is not impactful without policy entrepreneurs and indeed policy intrapreneurs, so people like Monica. So for those of us who are on the research side of things, you just don't get it done if you don't have clever, engaged, switched on people in government who want to help you get it done. So um, I, I can't, you know, commercial incompetence prevents me from speaking to a couple of projects we're working on at the moment. But it, we, we've got one project we're working on at the moment with the Victorian government where we've had immediate cut through of a fairly profound nature. And the evidence is great, but the, it wouldn't have mattered if the uh, team who are actually leading that work uh, weren't being savvy, weren't respecting their decision makers, weren't um, tapping into the needs of their minister. So that's absolutely critical. My fourth point um, is that we need to make better use of latent evidence. In a sense, I think this goes back to Monica's um, cry for don't walk into the minister's office and say you need more money to do more research. Now, of course, we're researchers and we're always going to say that. Um, but that said, I think, you know, we live in an era of big data. We live in an era of a lot of latent data. We talk a lot about open data, which relates to um, the data that governments hold and rendering that open. But uh, in the work that we do in the Centre for Social Impact, we also work a lot with philanthropy, non-profit organisations and some corporates who recognise that they hold an enormous amount of, of latent data that's of a private nature that could be better utilised. And I think that that's something I'd love to see um, in the next iteration of APO us going towards, is how we can better mobilise latent data the Productivity Commission, in their report on the not-for-profit sector in 2010, said, collect once, use often. Now, I think that's absolutely, that, that is a mantra for me, treading lightly on small organisations and collecting information once and using it as many times as possible is the way to go. But I think the next step beyond the collecting once is 
Don't even collect it. Look at what you've already collected and let's start there. And then my fifth point in my manifesto is that we do need to price in and value the function of evaluative evidence into policy uh, making. And I think we've come a bit of a way in Australia, but we're still a long way behind the eight ball, both amongst policymakers and philanthropists who are increasingly asking for outcomes-based approaches to um, program development, but are not funding, not investing in the work that's involved to actually understand what the outcomes are. That's enough for me, I think. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, my, um, I had a really good fun with uh, one of those senior economists. I was on a ministerial um, working party on affordable housing, and this guy was a senior economist from the New South Wales Treasury. He made this long speech at the first meeting about how his role was to bring evidence to the table, and then he spent the next six months telling anecdotes. So every time he'd start telling an anecdote, I'd put my hand up and say, I won't mention his name, but sorry, I think that's an anecdote. That's not really evidence. And it drove him um, completely mad. Um, but that was one of those, um, again, policy processes where um, 15 people sat around the table working on stuff for six months. A report was never released. Um, the minister's office killed it. But the minister wanted to look like he was doing something. So again, I enjoyed the chocolate biscuits and taunting um, Mr. Anecdote. But um, there was no sort of policy uh, outcome in that process. But th thanks very much for um, your manifesto. And we'll um, hand it over to Matt. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, and thanks to um, Monica and Joe for um, lots of things, which you're probably going to start to hear a bit of a pattern repeating. Um, but I do feel the need, in light of some of the commentary today, to make a confession that, to borrow a term I think Monica used, which is recovering. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a recovering political staffer. So I've been working in a Premier's office for, and for a Premier for the better part of four or five years and in Minister's offices before that and working for the Australian Centre for Social Innovation for about the last 18 months. And so I have seen some of those election processes, some of those budget processes in, at a state level, up close and personal and the coags and how decisions get made. Um, uh, and probably not time to go into it today, but a, but a large piece of my work when I was working um, for the South Australian Premier was looking at um, democratic innovations and different ways we could bring citizens into the process in ways that led to much more informed judgment so we're not getting this knee-jerk opinion poll kind of reaction to policy development which is what I think most of the complaints would be about um, when we tend to engage citizens. Um, but that might be a peculiarly South Australian phenomenon to feel quite that optimistic because it certainly runs counter to a lot of the experience going on globally. Um, but that's not the bulk of what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I want to talk about the Australian Centre for Social Innovation and I guess fundamentally what we think our role in the production of evidence is and what um, we see as good evidence um, in undertaking our work. Um, try and give you a couple of examples just to bring that to, to life for you um, and then leave you with a couple of maybe some discussion points really around what might be needed on the, on the um, our supply side and demand side for uh, social innovation as, as we see it to, to help it to grow and to really influence public policy at the highest levels. Um, so just um, if you didn't know, um, South Australian Centre for Social Innovation was the recommendation of Jeff Mulgren, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Nesta, which is a, a major innovation charity in the United Kingdom. He was a thinker in residence in South Australia in 2008. And one of the things he recommended was that we establish um, the centre. Um, and we've had, so we've had eight years now, very much a focus um, uh, consistent with Jeff reckon, Jeff's recommendations around practical innovation projects, getting out there and learning from doing, rather than um, uh, doing literature reviews and other things which form um, parts of the more traditional um, research. Um, and it really, um, I guess, um, was responding to this idea that whichever way you cut it, there was a whole lot of mounting social pressures, and these are some statistics which give indications to some of those things. Um, that we needed to realise that we, that we needed to broaden the base, we needed to produce new kinds of evidence, we needed to explore some parts, take deep dives into some parts of the evidence to uncover new ways of doing things because the old ways were starting to not work and costing us lots more money. Um, and that's where it becomes really problematic for people like politicians and senior public servants and anyone else, in fact, who's trying to deliver good outcomes for people. Um, and I think there's a, there's a really interesting point here. I mean, sort of there was, I mean, we were sort of, for us, it was really about a radical rethinking and reframing of the issues to try and lead to something quite different. 
And there's a point I think Alexander made in his opening statement about trying to bridge the gap between policy researching and policy making. And I guess we think of our role as trying to bridge the gap between policy making and policy doing, trying to bring those th two things closer together. Um, so what's um, our role in the um, production of evidence? What might give that some, um, some colour and movement for you? Um, this is Nicole. I'll talk about her in a moment, but I'll give you a little bit of context about why I want to talk about Nicole. Um, we really like to look for evidence at the extremes. So and in particular, we like to look for um, and, un and dig deeply into the evidence around people we call positive deviants, the people who, despite the odds being stacked against them, find some remarkable way to achieve a good life. Um, and then we try and understand what's happening in that context and bring it to other places and, and spread what works out of that. So in Nicole's case, I met Nicole in, in um, September 2016 and started to learn a lot more about her life. Um, the events of her life go something like this. She was pregnant when she was 16. Uh, she had uh, what I'll describe as a very difficult relationship, and you can probably read some more into that, but I won't reveal here. Um, uh, by the time she was in her early 30s, she was a grandmother. She um, uh, though had somehow got her life to a place where she had a family, it was stable, her children were well looked after, and it was because of that, that, and because of our work thinking about the child protection system, we were just increasingly putting more and more children into state care, to think about, well, what's a bit of a flip? What's a bit of a different way of thinking about people like Nicole? And that is, you could look at them as people whose life trajectory might be headed one way into a, a lifetime of welfare dependency, or it might be that they're just experts in how to get through really tough situations. Um, and so we thought about it in that kind of a frame. Um, and Nicole was one of the very first people that um, we approached to be um, what we call a sharing family um, in our family by family program. That's essentially a program, I'll, I'll oversimplify it here, um, but essentially a, a family that comes together who's been through some tough times, who's uh, matched up with a family who's going through tough times, and the family who's been through those tough times and worked out how to negotiate them, essentially mentors that other family. And the idea is to try and prevent that family in, you know, entering into the child protection system or other um, uh, social service systems. Um, and of course, what, what, what we found was Nicole, this was quite successful. We had lots of good anecdotal evidence about this. We had lots of good, uh, you know, we're now building, uh, internally we have some data that shows um, that for every dollar a government would spend on the family by family program, you're saving $7 elsewhere in all of the system and social supports that might otherwise um, be required. We're now trying to take that to another level of rigour around is this something we can verify and talk about much more openly, much more publicly, much more confidently? Um, um, but it was really this first question of reframe, reframing people like Nicole as an asset. And if you think about that peer-to-peer -peer kind of solution, it's eminently scalable. Um, it's one of the ways in which we found and uncovered a new resource. Um, and one of the great things about doing this process was we found... Um, you hear about, obviously, in policy making, unintended consequences. Um, well, we found unexpected benefits um, arising from this because the very act of asking Nicole, could you um, come on board and help us to help other people, changed her level of aspiration for her life. So the, she will tell you that the day she was asked was the day that she decided to go back to, or go to university, the first person in her family to do so. Um, she went on to study um, uh, behavioural psychology and is now employed, having recently completed her degree, employed in that field helping families. Um, that she did help in a more of a volunteer capacity through the Family by Family program. So that's the kind of work our approach takes. And, and that, that quote there is from Nicole, I feel like I've broken into generational cycle, and that's um, about her. That's how she feels about her life. That's not about her helping the 10 other families that she helped. That she's now, rather than a sort of passing on this, you know, from one generation to the next, sort of a, a lifetime of, of welfare dependency, she's actually passing on a much, much higher level of aspiration and opportunity. Um, so when we're doing that kind of work and developing those kind of responses, it's kind of been alluded to that it's a different thing. I've used this table. There are many like it. This one is just because I got it the other day on a blog from Strategizer. Um, um, but it tells you the difference. And this is really hard in government in particular. Like, government systems are really wired to what they call the performance engine. You know, keeping the hospitals open, keeping the schools open, keeping the machine running, trying to change that is really, really hard. Um, 
So what we're about is when we're doing innovation, you're trying to measure it on a different set of metrics because the objective is not to keep things running, it's actually to try and new things, um, but decrease the risk and the uncertainty. So real focus of that is this idea of around testing assumptions. Um, and we see that as crucial for managing risk. And this is kind of the diagram we use to explain it. Um, is that there's a, obviously there's a cost. If you go and develop a program and it doesn't work and it doesn't um, uh, make the right sort of, have the right kind of impact, then it's one, it's a lot of money down the drain. And number two, particularly in government, it can be a lot of political capital spent of your ministers, of the politicians who are, who are running the government. Um, we can perhaps talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so innovation for us is all about testing assumptions and that's led us to, you know, in family by family we had to test this idea would, you know, can we tap into the expertise that is in people like Nicole and is it going to be useful for other people? As I say, we've had sort of improving levels of evidence um, that that is the case. We've applied a very similar concept in the informal caring space so where people who aren't paid carers but just people like you and me who might be caring for an elderly parent or um, a partner or in some cases young carers caring for their parents, um, where we train people who, um, who have found a way to cope with being an informal carer because they are one of the most, in comparison to the rest of the population, one of the most severely depressed um, in the population, so very poor states of mental health. So we've applied a similar concept to family by family there. We're now much more recently getting into the work around rethinking what it means around home because home ownership as has been alluded to, is such an important part of Australian culture and our work into it has tried to understand the sort of the jobs that uh, home ownership has done as really, you know, home is this financial asset but it's also an expression of who I am and it's also a social gateway through which we connect with other people around us. So we're really trying to find ways in which, particularly for this baby boomer cohort, which is this big bulge moving through the population profile, how do we, how do we get a better handle on the social isolation and housing affordability issues for that group of people? because they're not all going to be jetting off around the world in tourism, not all going to be you know, going around Australia in a caravan having fun. There are going to be other people who are finding it much more difficult. Um, so that's led us to all sorts of ideas that we might try in that place. We're looking at, um, this is our place, which is a, a bit of a prototype we've developed around um, home sharing and what it takes to, um, for uh, older people to share a home together. Um, there are other things we're doing in that space as well, which is really around um, uh, uh, improving the security of tenure for people in rental accommodation, because um, you know, rental affordability is a major issue. Um, so we're looking at other coalitions of landlords that might come together. Our insights work, discovery work, is tending to suggest there are landlords who might come together to rent on much more secure terms for people. We're looking, talking to financial institutions about new kinds of loan products that might be possible to enable people to get over the, the barriers to home ownership. Um, and we're also looking at new models of home ownership where you don't have to own the whole lot, but you own a majority share. So you still get all of the sort of benefits, but with a little bit less of the financial um, burden that goes with it. Um, so there's sort of a whole heap of areas we're applying this, you know, essentially a design process. And we've, you've heard sort of talk about co-design and, and involving people in the creation of some of the new solutions that we need. And I've spoken to just very lightly some of the benefits of that. Um, uh, so, and that involves everything from prototyping and ethnography and a whole range of tools which I'm not expert in. Um, but one of the really interesting things I think now is we can do this and it often is that because of the nature of our work, we do it at quite small scale um, initially and then we look to partner up and build, build things out so that they can have an impact at a much greater level. Um, and one of my other jobs, uh, if you like, is um, as a curatorial committee for a thing called Open State, and it's very much related to my work at Taxi. We had our Indy Johar, who's um, uh, a professor in the United Kingdom, and we sponsored, sponsored him to come out and speak at Open State. Um, he talked about innovation needing a boring revolution, and it's a really, it doesn't sound it, but it's an interesting idea that we can do all of the really cool, fun things with post-it notes and Lego creatures and paper prototyping and all the things we do that are really fun to do at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation. But some of the work that's going to really make a difference now is taking some of those ideas and applying to them the new financial um, uh, products, the new uh, institutional arrangements and relationships, um, new forms of public engagement um, that enable all of these different system actors to collaborate in a way that leads to better policy um, that's got good evidence behind it and has the kind of impact that we want. Um, and, and I think that's really 
you know, the job for us on the um, supply side as, as the creators of kind of the, the good evidence-based policy is to find ways in which we can integrate better on the supply side. On the demand side, as, as has been touched on a bit today, it's about all of the people that we want to adopt and want to take on the ideas that we're creating and putting forward. What can we do to better support them? I'm a little bit, as you might imagine, having worked in a politician's office for such a long time, I'm a little bit more empathetic. I think they have incredibly difficult jobs. You wouldn't want to be a politician if your life depended on it. I tell you, it's horrible. Um, the amount of complaints um, you get about things you cannot do and the sheer volume of work that crosses your desk, it is really, really difficult for them. Um, that's, my, that's my personal experience of it. Um, so what could we do? One of the examples that I've seen um, in another field um, that I think is really useful is the idea of sort of peer, just peer forums for the adopters. So we come together like this, but what can we do to help our adopters? Technology companies tend to do this really well. Um, but what could we do? So, so I know that from um, in the climate change movement, there's an international NGO called the Climate Group, and one of those things they did was they got together a whole heap of subnational governments and said, we want you to be a part of our group that's going to reduce carbon emissions. Um, in 2015 in Paris, 44 of those subnational governments from five, six continents um, signed uh, an agreement that basically said that they will now um, reduce emissions by a level that isn't greater than what was committed to in the Paris Climate Agreement. So their ambition is much, much higher than the national governments that are committing. So what could we do in, in that space um, uh, with all of the work um, in social policy that we would like to achieve? And perhaps I might just leave it there. Okay, great. Okay, um, if you guys, um, uh, maybe you can share one of those guys. Do we need it? Um, yeah, just mainly for the film thing, um, if that's all right. Matt, Matt will grab a seat. Yep. I'm going to be the roving microphone person. Um, so I'm looking for, I, I, I don't mind walking around. Um, oh, have you? Okay, um, I'm sacked already. Um, but um, if you wouldn't mind just um, saying your name and where you're from, um, just for um, posterity's um, sake. So would anyone like to um, get the ball rolling? There's three very interesting presentations. Um, not very often you get a manifesto and um, you know five zappy rules um, before morning tea. So that, that, <laughs> that's excellent. And someone that wants to make innovation boring. So um, yeah, could you start at th th that table. The microphone will just run over to you. Thank you. My name is Leslie Russell. I'm from the Menzies Centre for Health Policy at the University of Sydney. And I've worked as a senior policy advisor in um, governments in both Australia and the United States. So I'd like to add uh, one more thing to the manifesto on that basis, and perhaps you can discuss it. And that is, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if ever there was an example of that happening, it was the people on the left who voted against Obamacare because it didn't go far enough. That's, I suppose, an argument for the, um, the outsiders. Uh, Monica, you hinted at that um, with the NGOs. For those who are on the inside, uh, the, uh, the flip side of that coin is something that I learnt from a congressman called Henry Waxman, who some of you might have heard of, Mr Tobacco. And he always said, if you can't get a loaf of bread through legislation, get half a loaf. And if you can't get half a loaf, get a slice and keep on coming back for a slice after slice till you've got the whole loaf. Now, of course, that assumes that you're going to be around long enough to do that. And he was around for about 45 years <laughs> to do it. But, but I guess that's what I would add from my experience. Thank you. No, thanks, Rach. M much less. Would there, any of the panel have a comment about um, that observation? I, only to agree with you completely. One of my funny colleagues used to say about my former department, Department of Health and Human Services, why have a small success when you can have a huge failure? Um, and that was the problem of that was the problem of the conflating agendas. So you have a small reform window, and then you try to drive. Um, every single thing that everybody had wanted to do through that window. But I, I must say, not very elegantly, I used to say to my staff, we're not trying to make a, you know, everything absolutely perfect, just a little less crap, right? <laughs> just, you know, let's be happy with doing no harm and getting some if it's improvement. An if it's an advance, 
<coughs> well, let's be happy. Let's be happy with that. I can only agree with you entirely. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I would agree too, and just think that it's really it's a point about momentum as well that you can get a bit of a foothold. You can build, start to build that coalition <coughs> of the willing that I think has been described um, before. Um, the only the only other thing I'd add to it is is about, um, and again, it was touched on in some of the um, remarks this morning, is about uh, the timing question and, and when to go and ask for and when to go for the big plays. Um, and I think Monica talked about the cycles and the various cycles, and certainly. Um, uh, I found in a state government a, a four-year term of government incredibly short and needing, and you felt sprinting in the first two years to get things done because you knew things were going to get much tighter fiscally and the political windows were going to get much smaller in the second half of the term. Um, uh, so you felt, found yourself sprinting. I can only imagine what that feels like in a federal government where you have three years. You really only get one shot at it, which is why I think you see lots of big um, uh, uh, blunders. And, I, and I, I think you know one of the big sort of policy um, cases that didn't work in one of the recent federal governments was the first um, budget that was put out by Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey, which was sort of wound back because they must have felt under so much pressure to try and achieve so much so quickly because of such a short time frame. They didn't even try to make a broader case. And in fact, some of their own analysis was it was just poor communication in the end, which I, I think is a bit of a, uh, a misassessment, put it that way, of the situation. Any comments on... Just the really observation from the from research Leslie? side, I mean, furious agreement, obviously. But I find it interesting in the academic setting, and I wouldn't say it's true of the majority of my colleagues, but for those colleagues for whom perfection is the need before the output gets given to the world, because if you're in, if you've chosen to be a researcher or a lecturer, then you should be in a state of constant inquiry. Like, our job is to learn, and our job is to be imperfect and to you know, find for our null hypothesis and all of those sorts of things. So I do find it interesting in the academic context where, you know, we should be letting it go quickly and, and then, you know, retesting, rethinking, reframing as we go along. Mm, thanks. Okay, we've got any, um, some other questions? Come on, up the back. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Ginny Barber. I work for the um, Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, so I work in... Um, and I'm relatively new to this in that I worked in pu publishing for a long time and, um, and in academia a long time before that. But so I just, ha I'm, I'm sort of still relatively new to trying to get policy through, to advocate. And, you know, um, I'm coming to the sort of uh, sad conclusion it's a really hard thing to do, <laughs> which um, I think probably everyone in this room knows. But one thing I've been really struck with recently was something I read where the, the most successful policies are where, when you do the vast amount of groundwork and then you're ready to jump when the moment occurs. And I think Matt touched on this just now. And I wondered if the, if the panel could give us give examples of where that's been successful or where you've seen that successfully applied. Um, really quickly, my area of research specialisation is social enterprise. And that was a, a thing that no one in policy and largely not for profit sector didn't understand for the first seven years I was studying it. So we're now in our centre, and I can see one of my colleagues is here, we're now in the absolutely perfect moment because the Victorian government has a social enterprise strategy, federal government's looking at social impact investing, social innovations, all the, all the things that we do are all the rage. So we've hit the right historical moment for that. But part of the reason why we're going so well is that there's 10 years tail sitting behind it. And we did that. I mean, I think you have to have an entrepreneurial mindset to a degree. You have to believe that what you're doing has some significance and at some point will, you know, have a, a productive effect. Yeah, actually, uh, something that Joe just said reminded me of a slide I saw at, a, at a, another conference, which was, um, some people in the room I'm sure have seen it, called the Innovator's Dark Night, um, which is this horrible experience you have where you start out with this entrepreneurial great idea, you get some initial supporters and things seem to be going very well and then it disappears into the abyss for anywhere and the slide is so depressing when you see it. Um, anywhere between two and ten years you could be in this darkness where you don't know if your idea is going to succeed. Um, and when you get to the end of it, this is what's kind of depressing about this as well, when it does start to emerge, it's been so long since you had the initial idea that it's everyone else's idea now and you're forgotten about. So it really is kind of an intrinsic motivation that is, that is at the heart of that entrepreneurial spirit that you need to engage with internally um, to sustain you through, <coughs> through those times. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah I, I think my example would be disability. Um, now, I'm not suggesting the NDIS is a perfect scheme, but there was a point at which my disability colleagues came to see me and said, 
we, we just don't know how to keep get this on the agenda. And I had to say, well, you yourselves, you the bureaucrats, cannot. What you have to be is ready for a moment when it does. And then between the Productivity Commission and some really high profile advocates and Julia Gillard, and, um, there, you know, there was a moment. And suddenly disability, the absolutely shameful forgotten secret of social policy um, was in the centre. And, you know, good policy entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs have, you know, have their bottom drawer um, full of very good ideas. Okay, thank you. The old bottom drawer trick. Okay, just the same table, yeah. Uh, Joe Kavanagh from Family Life and the Community Sector. I, I look forward to the day when we're not called the not-for-profits anymore because we're certainly for surplus. But I wondered about the evidence of public opinion in this and the, the notion that there are moments for change where, as um, Joe mentioned, there is you know, a tail behind that in terms of evidence. And I think the current response to family violence is one that shows you what happens when there is a sort of an event that the public cares about and it really motivates people um, and when there is actually better communication about what this issue is actually about to help motivate change, policy change and build some collaborations because that's one of the things that I think we've lost um, through competitive tendering, et cetera, is the capacity for people to leave brands and egos at the door and come together at that moment in time where the public opinion has made it clear there's an expectation for change and for progress. And it may well be that the successful vote on same-sex marriage is another moment for diversity and inclusion where the, the evidence of public opinion should be brought into when we can make an impact, when we can use the knowledge to drive good policy <coughs> strategy towards the outcomes that the public are asking for. So, so Monica, is public opinion, you know, part of the policy tools for a oh, bureaucrat? A absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, you can argue inside, um, but that, you know, you can argue inside and that often, um, you know, ha doesn't have much effect and what you want are these sort of third parties um, and what you particularly want is someone unex is an unexpected person or group people from the other side of politics not the usual suspects to come and do the argument so when the you know sort of blue ribbon liberal voters started talking about climate change that's a good moment um, in, the, in that way of building coalitions um, so it's you know the coalition of the willing and the coalition in a way of the unexpected um, can be very helpful. Uh, yeah, I guess I would just um, add to that that certainly um, Indy's slide, who I um, put up last, he talked about the boring revolution. He talks about um, systems financing, he talks about what he calls legitimate spaces, but UAs of public engagement. Um, and he does talk about these movements for change, and um, they, um, uh, they can be built up over a long period of time and things that are latent can be activated pretty quickly. Um, and you've got to be alert, you've got to have your wits about you with um, public events. Um, one event, which is, is probably getting a little bit long in the tooth now, but I'm sure a lot of us can remember, is the, um, the uh, National Gun Buyback Scheme. And it took one event to spark a major change in policy on that, which people have been grinding away at for some time. Um, if only the United States would follow suit on that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so adding to that, I mean, yes. The, the event, the intersection with the media, our exposure to the images, you know, I mean, the, I, you know, if we look at the family violence um, issue and the intersection <coughs> between the Royal Commission, Rosie Batty's experience and other dimensions that were at work, they all coalesced to inform public opinion. I guess the other thing is framing and, you know, I, I attended a session, some of you might have attended um, recently, um, a leader of the same-sex marriage campaign from the States came to Australia and he was reflecting that the moment that they changed public opinion was when they reframed from a rights discourse to a love discourse. And they stopped talking about the problem as rights and started talking about it as love. That was when they felt they got the public on board. So there's clearly a communications and cultural piece in that. I'm a sociologist, can you tell? Um, uh, uh, about actually shaping public opinion as well as galvanising the public opinion as it coalesces. Okay, no thanks. We've probably got time for one more question if there's one out there. Um, 
Okay, just in the middle table, and then we'll go have some morning tea. Um, my name's David Crew, and I work for an Indigenous Knowledge Centre in Daniloquin, and um, also a PhD student at Macquarie University. Um, just in that term of pu public opinion, I suppose there's two big things that affect our community was the intervention in the Northern Territory and the, invest the Royal Commission into Dondale. And so this constant response from government on an, on an issue that might come up through various means, but then continually reinforces a negative or, or a, a deficit-based approach, that just seems to go on and on and on and on and on. And yet we don't have any, we don't seem to have traction except when we look at very local communities and that scale of what people are doing locally. I wonder about the challenge of building from local scale solutions up into higher frames um, could counter some of these um, negative approaches. This might not be popular because I do recognise that, you know, population level macro interventions are needed to change a lot of things. But I'm a bit sick of talking about scale because my area is social enterprise and social entrepreneurship. There's an assumption that scale looks like commercial scale, but what I observe is communities scaling deep into community, seeing, you know, here's a solution, oh, now here's another problem, let's solve that one, let's solve that one. And I really think that we need to change the discussion about scale to talk about what networked scale might look like. Um, because of our geography and demography, it's pretty hard for people who do the doing to come together in these kinds of conversations. So we all get together and, you know, wax lyrical and tear our hair out, because I was doing before, um, but the doers don't. But I think that we need to look at models for doing that. And this is very big, but one example is the LEADER program in the European Union. And the LEADER program was a regional development program. And one of the contractual obligations of being a leader community was that you then had to mentor the next leader community. And that was really a great model of actually sharing that knowledge and practice so that change happened in a networked manner rather than changing um, macro policy. But of course, I totally understand that we need to do that, that as well. Yeah. Um, uh I'm not experienced in that area of policy at all, so I won't, I won't make um, too much comment. But other than just to reflect again on, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing we tried to do with Nicole's story and people like Nicole, is look at them as people with great experience and attributes that can contribute, make a contribution. And that because we had that frame around it, it actually led to the unexpected benefits. Um, and the more we can tell stories like that about what what is possible, um, the more I think we can capture the public imagination and start to um, encourage others and adopt these networked approaches that Joe's talking about. Okay, a bit of battle-scarred bureaucrat yeah. wisdom here. I've been down this road. I've, I've tried to explain to ministers um, that they have to let go, um, we, that everything will be done differently. We have to give communities the power to make their own choices. They'll all come up with different solutions at different scales. You won't be able to put out a media release that says, people in Victoria will be benefiting from blah, blah, in that sort of trope they always have. Um, and I'd be lying if I said that was a, you know, that went down really well. Um, and actually, I felt, I wish the stakeholders were here with, would, would come in and support this, because this is just a bureaucrat arguing this. And what you actually need are the people who really, really want these things to give ministers some protection, as much against their own colleagues um, and the budget process, which is not sympathetic to this sort of uncertainty contingency locality, um, rather than the, the bureaucrats pretty well, I think, cannot, cannot do it. So it would have to be communities saying... We will not be. We'll, we will let this run. We will give it a space. We won't be, you know, saying how come they got this and we didn't get that. And, um, that would be, you know, as a poli political advisor, might have the same. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, totally. Um, that um, I, I guess I have a more empathetic view, as I've described, of people in those positions in political offices, and it's about what can we do to assist them to do things differently. Um, um, if we want to unpack the idea that politicians should just do what's right, not what's necessarily also in their own interest as a politician, then we're really talking about changing the political system. Um, and so that's the kind of scale of question, sorry to use that term, Joe, um, that emerges in, so it does, so we've got to think about how can we work, what sort of value propositions can we create for them in the system we have, and, and the sorts of things that Monica's talked about are really helpful. Okay, look, we've run out of time, but can we um, please thank Joe, Matt and Monica? <laughs> for.
a great start, which um, something that promises to be a very interesting day. Um, and we're going to have morning tea for about um, 25 minutes. So um, we'll see you back here uh, in about 25 minutes. And they're getting some wine, but they're not supposed to drink it at morning tea. Oh, no, seriously, I've given it up. I've given it up. But uh, the very look, look at that. How good is that? Okay, so um, morning tea will be at the back of the room. Um, and uh, you'll hear the announcement to restart.